Yep. Okay. And I think that we will, I will hand straight over to Pauline, who is going to run today's session. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I'm going to start to share my screen. I've got a couple of slides. Um, I like slides because I think they give a bit of context to whatever you, uh, session you're in. But I don't like too many slides because I think they become very boring. So I've got a few, but not too many. So it won't be death by presentation or anything. But really, I'm hoping that will trigger some questions, some queries, some discussion um, around the topic of democratic finance. And the first thing I'm going to do before I do that is actually sort out my phone so that actually it doesn't keep buzzing in the middle of the session. Okay, so share my screen. Bear with me while I do this. Okay. Can you see that okay? Uh, yeah, you need to pop it into presenter view. It's gone back to... Uh, sorry, uh, from beginning, where? Uh... You were on from beginning. From the beginning, yes, I thought I'd click that. Sorry, I thought I'd click that. Okay, so basically the session is going to be about democratic finance and in particular how your community can become your investors. Um, it's part of the community-led tourism week and very much part of the pilot whereby there was an understanding that um, community-led tourism would consider financial sustainability going forward and how they were going to do things in the longer term and more importantly how they were going to finance them from the longer term. My name is Pauline Hinchin, I'm the director of Scottish Communities Finance Limited. So just to give you a brief overview, um, Scottish Communities Finance Limited, we are a registered community benefit society and like all community benefit societies we're registered with the FCA um, we started in October 2017, so we were just getting going when COVID hit, but um, we work with third sector organisations to raise affordable, patient, repayable finance from within their communities. And when we go on through the presentation, um, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. So first of all, what do we mean by geography or by community? I think um, most people see it predominantly in terms of the community of place or geography. So I live in a certain area and my neighborhood is a certain place. But when we talk about democratic finance, you're looking at the widest possible constituency. So your community becomes defined by community of place, but perhaps equally, it could be about memberships or associations. Equally, it could be about customer or your clients. It could just as easily be your community as your stakeholders, your volunteers, you know, the local authority that you work with, your staff, potentially even an expatriate community. If you're doing stuff overseas, it can be your suppliers. So we're looking at when we talk about democratic finance, we're talking about community in the widest possible sense in order to ensure that the actual raise that you're trying to, um, the money you're trying to raise with um, democratic finance, actually you hit your targets. So it can be all of those things. It can be a combination of those things, but it's the widest possible number of people that want to help you succeed. So what do we mean by democratic finance? This is where money is sourced from many people rather than from an institution like a bank or a building society. And really the reason that it's um, when it goes down to, the, to being about many people and you take out the middleman, often the money is cheaper or in the case of crowdfunding, it's free. Um, and, but what it does is allows your community to invest in your organization. For a, usually for a small social return in the case of maybe crowdfunding, but maybe a small financial return and a social return when you're talking about community bonds and community shares. And really investors have a vested interest in making the organization successful. They're putting their money where their mouths are and therefore they're very interested in making sure that you succeed longer term. It's not a case of here's all my money, I want to back no matter what happens to the organization. You know, um, it, it, as a community benefit society, the FCA insists that we prioritize, prioritize the needs of the community and the needs of the organization 
over any of the investors that may put money into your organization. So predominantly there's three forms of democratic finance within the third sector. There are other types like P2P and B2B, but really these are the three main types, which is crowdfunding, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's been around for a while and used to raise donations or any one-off contribution. Moving down to community bonds, which is used to raise low interest, long-term repayable investment. And then you're looking for community shares who are looking to find owners who invest in long-term repayment investment. So I'm just going to whip through community fund, that's community finance, or community fund, sorry, crowdfunding. Um, and that's really because a lot of you will know about it. You know, it's usually donations of money for a one-off project. It can offer, you can offer a reward for the donation and those rewards can be different depending on the sum of money that is donated. You normally do it through a platform that's managed by others. Um, it can be different types of crowdfunding. It can be all or nothing, which is basically if you don't raise all the money that you want, then you get nothing. Or you can do a keep it all kind of a model whereby if you raise 90% of the money, you'd be able to keep that. There's normally a fee, although crowdfunder at the moment doesn't charge for a fee for the use of their platform, but there is always a transaction fee um, of between 1.9%, 2.4% and plus 20 pence if you are going to use a platform. And then on top of that, there's credit and debit card fees and PayPal fees. So although the money is a donation, and in that sense, it's free money, there are the costs of using democratic finance, using crowdfunding. And um, the next one is around community bonds. And these are predominantly what Scottish communities finance work with. Um, and really our ambition is to create uh, um, uh, Scotland to make Scotland a nation of citizen investors and really so what we're looking at here is these can be used for um, securing repayable long-term patient finance so there's no ownership or governance responsibilities you just need the money you don't want members you don't want owners you just want money and um, as an FCA registered organization, we have to do a community bond offer prospectus when we are doing community bond offers. And investors become very um, interested in making the organization a success. So for example, we were working with a theater, they were expanding, um, developing other parts of the theater. And basically, you know, as an investor, you're more likely to go along and use the theater because the most successful the theater is the more chance there is that you're going to get your money back. Bonds can't be sold. There's no secondary market um, and there are fixed repayment dates. So for example, a 10 year fixed community bond means that in 10 years time, the people who've put money in will want their money back, but not before. And that's where the patient capital aspect of the money comes in. It is not something that you have to start repaying back tomorrow like you would a mortgage, you know, you get your mortgage the first month of the next first week of the next month and every week of every month thereafter you have to make repayments of a certain sum of money. This is very much about giving organizations time to put in place whatever it is that they want to do before they start to repay the money. It's suitable for large or small types of finance. So we have done as small as 17 and a half thousand pound community bonds. And we have also been involved with a 2.1 million pound community bond finance, and everything in between. It, the most important thing is that it's suitable for most types of economic development. So if you're considering community bonds, it has to be an economic development that you believe will generate an income in order to repay back the bond holders which are invariably members of your community. They could be your neighbours, they could be your customers, they could be your clients, they could be your members, but ultimately they're people that um, you would like to give your, their money back to them. You don't want to take the money from them. Um, there is a fee charge to do a bond offer, and that's usually um, based on the percentage of the money that you're trying to raise. Um, we keep fees very small for um, very small bond raises, um, but overall they're, they're relatively affordable because we do get some money from the Scottish Government to help 
make this happen. Um, you can do more than one bond offer for different stages of development. So if you go back to the theatre, for example, um, we did a bond offer and then um, three years later, they want to expand this again. They want to open a new part of the theatre. We did another bond offer. And we know from evidence that people who invest the first time, some 39% of them um, will invest the second time. But like crowdfunding, you can also offer rewards. So you can, um, you can say to somebody, you know, um, if you become a bond investor every year on your birthday, we'll give you two free tickets to attend the theatre, whatever is on. And of course, what that does is create a new customer base and a new client base for, the, for your organisation going forward. In community shares, very similar, a vehicle for securing repayable patient finance. Again, organizations must be registered as a BENCOM. In this case, though, the investors become the owners and members of your organization. So by its very nature, anybody that's a shareholder is an owner of, of whatever, they're, they're, whatever they're investing in. Um, so as such, they do have governance and ownership responsibilities. And in Scotland, community shares have been predominantly used for capital assets. So to buy a harbour, to buy pubs, to buy shops, to buy buildings. Um, and again, like community bonds, a prospectus must be produced because we are both registered with the FCA. In the case of repaying your investors as a community shares um, um, offer, you know, your Bencom rules determine when and how the shareholders get repaid. So um, the rules might say at a certain point, we're going to repay a certain percentage of our shareholders. Or a share owner might say, might need to give notice that they wish to withdraw their shares and get repaid for their investment. It's very different to community bond where there's a fixed date, year five, year seven, year 10, whatever people will need their money back and people are expecting their money back because this is written into the community bond prospectus. Again, community shares suitable for small or large finance. Um, I know that the first one, the, the harbour was 70k, but we also know that there's been 2.5 million pound community share offers. And again, community shares can offer rewards um, to encourage people to purchase a community share. And that's it, basically. Um, let me just stop sharing. I appreciate that there was a lot of information, but as I say, I hate kind of spending all the time going through a presentation. It's meant to just trigger some questions, some queries, some clarification, some anything you don't understand. We can kind of use the rest of the time to do that, or I can go back over the slides if somebody would like to go through them again and ask particular questions from particular points. But certainly that should give you a flavor of what we're talking about. That's what democratic finance is in relation to the sector. And now it's kind of over to you, basically, unless I've stunned you all into silence. <laughs> Thanks, Pauline. That's been really interesting. Does anybody have initial questions? Dizzy? Yeah, well, <laughs> my neck. Um, what kind of contracts would you create around the bonds and, and the shares? Um, what do you mean by the word contract? Uh, what written documentation, should, what should okay. you, for good okay. practice you should have. But yeah, Yes, what, okay. Yeah. So both, both of them, you know, you cannot go out to your community looking for investment unless you've got a prospectus. And that prospectus has to be very clear. So this is what we're trying to raise. This is what it's for lots of warnings about your money is at risk, like you will get in any other um, financial product, whether it's a bank or anything else. Um, there'll be in the price of the bond or the price of the share, so how much you can buy. Sometimes there's a minimum purchase, so you have to buy, you know, say they're 50 quid and you have to buy two. Sometimes there's not, you can buy as many or as little of them as you want. And like all democratic finance, there's an open date and a closing date. So that's to raise the money. Um, in the terms of community bonds, we the we are the um, we actually have the registration with the FCR. 
So you don't actually need to be a registered Bencom, you use our Bencom. But if you want to go down community shares, if you don't have a Bencom um, structure at the moment, you might have a SKIO, Company Limited by Guarantee, registered charity, then you have to set one up in order to actually process your own um, share offer. Um, so that's kind of on that side of it. In relation to the other side of it, there's obviously each of um, all registered Bencoms have a set of rules which have to be approved by the FCA. And that determines um, the upper, it's like your normal Memon Arts or something like this, but there's a bit more in there because it's financial. So it, it, in our case, it specifies the maximum we can charge um, in terms of interest, um, which we keep as low as we possibly can, because the purpose is to get the money to you as, as affordable as possible. It says things like we can prioritize um, investor returns. So if I was looking, doing a bond off of 20K and somebody said to me, you know, um, here's 10K, but I want 7%. And the fact is the project can only give 2%, then we would have to reject that because actually that would be prioritizing the needs of the investor over the sustainability of the long-term sustainability of the organization, because that actually could make the difference between the 2% and the 7% could make the difference between success and failure. Um, in terms of a share, um, obviously when you become a share owner, you are very much part of the organization. You have will have a membership of that organization. You will have um, a vote as a member and you are an owner. In the case of a bond, you are purely an investor. And that is about um, the registration form comes into us. We have an escrow account. We maintain the investor role. But if you're doing the community shares, you would do that all yourselves as an organization because you are the registered organization with the FCA. Um, I'm trying to think, it's, does that kind of cover your questions, Jizzy? Brilliant, thank you. We've got another question from Artemis. Artemis, do you want to come in and, and ask rather than just the chat? Oh, you're still muted. <laughs> I raised my hand again instead of um, unmuting. So I was just wondering, how would you decide between a community bond approach and a share approach? Um, we okay. on the Isle of Rassi went down a shares approach to build our community hydro, but we didn't even consider bonds. It wasn't on the table. Yeah, well, they're relatively new and really they, they you know, they come in to try and bridge the gaps with or the issues with community shares. So, for example, if you are an organization that has quite a robust membership structure, so you've got lots of members from your local community, you mightn't want any more members, you mightn't want any owners, but you still want money. So that would be one of the differences between going for shares rather than a, whereas an organization would come to us and they do sometimes thinking they're going to do a community bond, but really they say things, oh, we want the whole community to be involved. We want the whole community to feel a sense of ownership of this you know, building or whatever, then we would say, well, maybe you should consider community shares. And um, so that's one of the one of the principal differences around it. And obviously the the other differences um, is, you know, if you're if you are registered as a community benefit society, which you, Artemis, if you have um, done the community shares, you probably have. You may or you may need to or if you want to do community bond, for example, maybe you don't want any more share owners, maybe you don't want any more members. You can go obviously go back out to your shares holders again if you wanted to raise more money. Um, equally, you could do a community bond and often they can be used in tandem. You can use a community bond where maybe you're going out to a much wider constituency that maybe you don't, you know, like give an example. If you were doing something that you felt had a lot of um you may be a lot of um a lot of people in america a whiskey project would really be interested in this you might want to do a bond with them because you're quite comfortable having the ownership and the membership structure locally um and you just really want them coming in as with their money effectively if, if i can be as crude as that I that, think that is that, really useful to know and actually our distillery has just approached us to inquire around the um, connection between them and the hydro with a private wire, which would cost thousands upon thousands of pounds. And, and actually community bonds might be a way we wouldn't, we've not, I, I don't think that's a viable proposition 
from an engineering perspective, but if it was, it might be the kind of thing then that we could seek community bonds for. Yeah, I mean, there's there's nothing to say the two of them are incompatible. It's just been very clear from the outset, you know, as a lot of organizations, especially when they're doing this for the first time, you know, they will come to say they're very clear they want the community to have a sense of ownership. And community shares is the best way of doing that because they have some responsibility and they have governance and they have a vote and an AGM. Some of them just they just want money basically, you know, they're quite comfortable. And that can be around, we say, a sports facility or something like this. You know, they've got quite a robust membership already. They don't necessarily, you know, um, all they're looking for is money. That's not to say that the members can't be investors, but they can't, um, but, but they certainly um, don't want new owners and new investors coming in and new members coming in. They just want money. And that's the best way to think about it, really. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Jackie? Hi, thanks. Yeah, that's interesting to hear that you can do a bond and a share in tandem. And I'm wondering whether it's possible to do a model that blends rewards crowdfunding with a community share offer or a bond issue, um, or if that might be an approach that can work together in some way. Um, what we have found, um, we tried to do that once before, where we tried to do a crowdfunding model and community bond together. We found that people were quite confused because it was a very, most of the community in that case was geographical. It was a relatively small sum of money. We knew we could raise the money fairly locally. We didn't need to go think too creatively about who the constituency might be, which obviously the more money you're trying to raise, the more you have to think about, right, would this be of interest, this might be of interest of people, for example, who are interested in maritime history, this, it might be interested to people who are in, so, um, so we did that, but we found it was very confusing that people didn't know, given that this is just normal people here, you know, and it, it, we already helped them quite a lot in terms of how we present information so that people aren't bamboozled because most of us don't see ourselves as being investors. You know, investors are people with lots of money over there and they have F IFAs and all that kind of stuff with independent financial advisors. So there's already, a, but then they see a bond offer going on at the same time as a, a crowdfunding offer. Um, and they're not quite sure if they're the same thing. Um, they're not quite sure which is the best thing to do. Should they just give it to the crowdfunding? They tend to then give relatively small sums of money, whereas you might want them to give maybe three, five hundred pounds into it. So we have found it to be quite confusing for people that we're trying to attract in terms of give money. Um, but also in terms of the business model, um, you know, you're trying to say to a group of people, you know, we're, do, we're going to be doing one shortly. They're moving into a new facility and um, they've always done a lot of crowdfunding. So we're trying to say to people this time, oh no, the, the business model, because when you do crowdfunding, there's an acceptance of donation that somehow you not get your money back. But when you're asking people for 500 pounds, they want to know that you're going to make enough income. So the whole thing gets very convoluted, I would say. Um, so we're very clear that all the crowdfunding will stop while we're doing this in order to not confuse people and in order to give them a business plan that shows that their money will be repaid. In this case, it's a five year fixed bond offer. Does that help, Jackie? It does. So you could do a bond or a share offer in tandem, but you would do crowdfunding either pre or post either a bond or a share if it, it was targeting something specific? Potentially, yes. I mean, there's nothing stopping you doing all of those things. You know, it's entirely yeah. down to yourself. But it's, in the case of the share and the bond, the, there's a lot of crossover in terms of one prospectus, for example. Um, you might be very clear that you're targeting your share offering your local geographic community or your local members because you want them to have an ownership, but yeah. you're, you're doing your bond in a completely different constituency. Um, so um, but the but the kind of the business plan will be the same. You want to be able to show your shareholders and your bondholders you can pay the money back. So there's differences, whereas the crowdfunding, I think, um, is, it is definitely different because the donation model versus the repayable model, it's quite difficult for people to get their heads around in terms of people out there in your community. 
but there's nothing in theory stopping you doing one and then doing the other. And, and indeed, we've had a situation whereby, you know, we have done a bond offer and then we went on to phase two and we've done a second bond offer, you, you know, so you can you can layer them is what I'm saying. And that's the beauty of them. What you don't want to do, though, is go back to the same 100 people five times. <laughs> and and I think the importance for me of the community bond model is you, when people get their money back, because in shares, obviously, it's up to the, the, the members to say when they can give you a share, when, when they buy back your shares. But, um, you know, when you give people the money back, what we've discovered is they go, oh, well, OK, I got my money back. I'll, and then somebody else does something, they'll invest again. So it's kind of like they've got the confidence to do it the second time and uh, around. If, whereas I think with the, the donation, it's very much a one off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Fiona, you've popped something into the chat as well. Do you want to, to come in? I just trying to unmute. Um, what stage um, should a community project approach you? Um, I'm working with a community in Hoyk at the moment who are at the consultation process. They're going out to the community um, and the next phase will be the, the funding process. So when should they approach you? And okay, so, mm -hmm. so, sorry, it's a really large project. It's nine million pounds. So okay. uh, um, we're going to have to look at various sources of funding. So can this work alongside um, other sources of funding that we'd be looking at? Yeah, I mean, it, well, to take the, the first part of the question, um, I suppose from the point of view of community shares, community bonds, certainly, you really have to have an idea of your costs. You know, um, it doesn't have to be done to the last shilling pence, but certainly, you know, you need to know you're looking for 9.1 million versus 8.75 million because you know, when we do a prospectus and we put it out there, it's what to be very clear about what the money's for and how much it's for. And it's new you saying to somebody, we're looking for around 9 million, because why would you raise 9.5 million if all you need is 9 million? And it gives the impression that you don't really know what you want to do. If you go the other way, which is you're saying that this is 8.5 million, but if we raise 7 million, um, unless you're doing things in stages, it looks like you're going to cut corners. So I think as long as you're able to evidence your, in this case, you will obviously have, and it sounds like if, let's say it's a building, so you'll have architects plans, quantity surveyor costs, and this is what you need to give people confidence to, that you know what you're about, because all, everything to do with money is to do with confidence. Do you, do people feel, oh yeah, this is, they know what they're doing, they've got everything lined up, their business plan looks good, they've got the quantity surveyor, they've got their architect, and they've got 70% of the money. Now that money could come, leading on to your second question, Fiona, that money could come from, we'd say you might get some donations, you might get a grant from Scottish Land Fund or something like this, and you're just looking for a more blended, what's known as a blended finance, so you have 70 or 80% and you just need to raise the other 20% from some sort of democratic financing mechanism. Um, so, you know, when you're in the one hand, so on the one hand, I think you need to be thinking about it in terms of who, who are our constituents and who do we go out to? And if we are going to have, you say, a 50-50 split um, in relation to um, loan finance versus grant finance, you know, then the sooner that you can start thinking about um, who they're going to be, because your pitch will be very different. The pitch deck will be different, you know. So, for example, if you were doing something to do with raising a ship from the ocean, you know, you what you would, the, the pitch you would be making to, we'd say, um, people who are interested in old boats would be different to people who are interested in maritime history disasters, different from people who are local looking at jobs and employability. So really, you can't begin early enough, I suppose, is what I'm saying. But on the other hand, you have to have some sense of how much you're trying to raise and what you're going to do with this. So it's not, it's not a linear process, I think, Fiona, is what I'm saying, is at a certain point, you know, approximately and you need to start thinking then beyond that you know well where are we going to get all this money and that will be part of your funding package thank you artemis so it was just a comment on something that pauline said before about people's confidence and their 
interest in um, supporting these kind of projects. And what we found when we were trying to raise the money for the hydro, the crowdfunder itself was really, really helpful because they're starting to collect the names and contact details of individuals who they note through their system like to invest in particular areas like community renewables or pubs or housing. And I think, I'm not sure how they do this, but they approach them and say, do you want to be part of a database whereby if something comes up, um, we can alert you to this personally. And so we got quite a lot of investment through this database that Crowd, Crowdfunder had set up. So it's clearly a lot of, and, and not big money, but you know, maybe 500 pounds, a thousand pounds, but people who like to, to support this sort of stuff and obviously have the money to do so, it's, it was really good. I mean, certainly Crowdfunder um, has got really innovative recent, you know, when I, when I, you know, was dealing with them, which was a good couple of years ago now. It was very much of the whole thing was started. But now, of course, they have relationships with local authorities, you know, and if you raise so much money by, we'd say, let's just say you're looking to raise 10K or 5K or something, you raise so much, the, you, the local authority will add true crowdfunder will add the balance. So for every pound somebody gives you, they'll put a pound in. They've quite been innovative in that way, but equally in relation to platforms, you know, if you're looking at predominantly, if you're looking at a, a, a repayable investment uh, model, ETHEX is a very, E-T-H-E-X, it's a really good model. And again, they're very similar. They've got a pool of investors that want to come in. I think the reason we don't do that is we try to make this as, as um, I suppose we're looking for people who feel part of that community and want to see it succeed because the chances are we're not going to offer you 5%. The chances are we're going to try and get money. Like we've got money at 0.85%, which means the organization has money at 0.85%. So we're trying to get money genuinely from people that will get, we'll offer them more than what they'll get in the bank, more than what they might have in an ISA, which is very small sums of money at the moment. But we're never going to be meet, beating the market. You're not going to get six percent at this moment in time when, when interest rates are so low. So it's very much about people who are who who recognise that, you know, they're giving they're getting the same as what they're getting in the bank, but they're getting all this wonderful community stuff rather than a, 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 I suppose a portfolio of investors who are looking to get five percent in renewables, for example. So, but there are lots and lots of. Um, vehicles out there that actually you can do that so crowdfunding yes but also ethex is a very good one if any of you are interested in that lovely does is anybody else get any other questions or thoughts all going quiet now jackie do you want to say something about how the crowdfunding competition has gone oh, jackie yes i've just seen that to scotland it's going, it's going really well. We're just in the midst of our third round at the moment. So we've got another, there's supposed to be 20 projects, but we've currently got 19 projects crowdfunding. Um, and they can get up to £10,000. It's, it's done by milestones. So there's four milestones. Um, I think we've got eight currently have hit milestone two. So they've got uh, £2,500 match funding from Creative Scotland and another seven have hit the first milestone. So have a thousand. Um, so in total, 60 businesses have collectively raised um, somewhere in the region, because we've, we've not finished this round yet, but sort of 400,000 plus now from, um, it'll be close to probably 10,000 supporters by the time this round is finished. Um, and it's certainly, I think, definitely helping to raise awareness of crowdfunding as an alternative means um, um of 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 funding your ideas and, and your projects crowdfunder are, are keen to continue we're content, keen to continue with it as well and i've had a very brief early conversation with with crowdfunder about what we might do next round and they are very keen on community shares and trying to understand how there might be a model that creative scotland crowdfunder and community shares can can work together um, so I'm mainly here today to try and understand a bit more about community shares and community bonds and to try and understand how all that might work. 
um, because I think that's the, the ambition that we can come up with something for the next the next phase of the work we do in this area. And I, I know that um, down south, for example, Power to Change, um, which was a large um, legacy, I mean, multi-million pound legacy. I know that they do stuff around some of this stuff, Jackie, which you might be interested in, basically, um, whereby they match um, let's just say a relatively um, a, a small community, maybe maybe a community of disadvantage. You know, for every pound they'll put in, um, power to change, we'll, we'll put a pound in. So that's very similar to the crowdfunding because it's a blended finance model. Um, um, and equally, for example, um, in our case, for trying to encourage people to think um, especially people in our more um, disapproved areas, where basically, you know, the perception is that um, everything must be done to people. You know, the national lottery kind of underpins some of ours. So basically, if it's in the right area, so we're able to say to people, you will get your money back because we've got a, a, a guarantee scheme in place with them. So the idea is really to give people confidence and to de-risk, because what you're doing there is and and is de-risking the proposition so for example if if it needs 10k to do something but i've already got 5k then my risk um of a grant or however and um, then the risk of my money is significantly reduced because it means really that the, the success has to come from the 5k rather than the 10k if that makes sense um, so the whole concept of kind of blended finance coming from a different source, which um, Fiona will definitely have to get involved in because, she, you know, nine million pounds is going to need a lot of different forms of money, I think, in there. So, yeah, so crowd. I didn't realise that Creative Scotland were doing that with crowdfunder, I have to admit. But, but I know, like, um, there's a couple of local authorities does it in Scotland. So I hadn't realised, Jackie. So yeah, that's Penn, really Penn good. Russell, Council have been doing it, I think. They've yes, got a business fund at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, certainly that's um, one of the um, one of the, the other differences, I think, between and again, crowd community shares and community bonds. So a, a, an organization that we're working with in another part, they're very much interested in the fact that they have a group of people that would like to be start their own businesses, but they can't get access to any loans. So we're going to potentially capitalize it. And indeed, we have done this as well in the past, where we use bonds to capitalize the, the, the money for the loan. And then, but the, but the community determines the eligibility. So it has to be somebody from this area. It has to be a young person starting out. It has to be somebody, you know, that, um, you know, they don't have any, they don't have a mortgage, so they can't get a securitized loan. Somebody has been turned down by the bank. And so, you know, it, you can, I suppose the, the point is that there's so many ways you can spin all of this now. That, that's what makes it so important, I think, in terms of, in terms of the whole concept. It's not about going to the bank and being told no. It's actually about, you know, how do we, all of this is about how do we find a cheap source of money? That's, and if you can go to your community and they genuinely like what you're doing or your members or whatever it is, and they want to see you succeed and they've got a couple of pounds and you're going to give them the exact same as what they'll get in the bank, then that's, that, that's kind of the model going forward, I think. There's a great question there from Artemis in the chat. Pauline, do we know roughly how much community finance is being invested in Scotland? Any idea if that's been recorded anywhere? Um, well, I know the community shares put out um, a report, but I mean, it was before COVID, so I don't know how, how up to date that is. And we do have like um, what is known as community, um, Responsible Finance, which is Community Development Finance Institution, but that is much wider than democratic finance. It is about, it is about investing into the sector. But it is about different types of mechanisms, not all of them. Like CIS, for example, Social Investment in Scotland, they're a member, we're a member. But what CIS do is very different to what we do. So in terms of Scotland, I'm not aware of any research. That is the most recent. And we haven't been around long enough. We've done some research recently just on the, we've done three or four bond offers. Um, and, you know, the average investment, I think, was £454 or something like this. Um, but certainly um, the last one that I know of was Community Shares one. But as I say, it's probably well out of date now because it was definitely before COVID. 
Yeah, absolutely. But it's an interesting question, actually, which we should really, which I should really um, think about doing something about. How do we, how do we measure that? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe an opportunity to link in one of the universities. Yeah, I need to speak to, I need to speak to more of the community shares or some somebody else. Yeah. Did he? Yeah, it just reminded me of a arts organisation I worked with about twenty years ago, and they. I wasn't involved in the finances, but they called it soft loans, where people would loan them large amounts of money and it would be paid after like a five or 10 years. But very often the people would like what the organisation were doing. So they would just say, oh, we'll add on another 10 years. And more than often the people would die and just the money <laughs> would get to the organisation. So it was never, ever paid back. <laughs> Well, certainly, I think in terms of I know that, um, again, community shares and, and I think this is probably definitely about 2017 or 2016, but, you know, it's going back a couple of years. I know that they did a piece of work and something like 80 percent of people donated their 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 investment. Um, however, the one thing I would say is you cannot you can't do a community shares or a community bond offer on the expectation that 80 percent of people isn't going to want their money back. You have to go forward on the grounds that if everybody wants their money back, you have to be able to have the money to give it back. If they then, like when we go out to people, we say, would you like to donate your money? <laughs> and, 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 you know, would you like to donate your capital or your interest or whatever? And because pe because we hold the, the investor, pro, um, investor um, roles, you know, the organisation, they don't know who invested, only we know who was invested. And we, so we do put them in and, you know, they, they, do, they do give it back. Some of them will give it back. When you're getting it up into chunky sums of money, you know, people are less reluctant because five thousand pounds is a lot of money to donate. Um, but the good thing is, if you're an organisation and you're thinking along that, then the one thing I would say is get registered for gift aid because all your donations could then be gift aided at that point where we have an email from somebody saying we would like to donate this. Then it becomes a gift aid that you can add to that sum of money. But we always begin and we make it clear from the beginning because we sign, coming back to the question that was asked earlier on uh, about paperwork, the first thing we do is we sign an MOU with the organisation and um, the MOU makes it very clear, you know, that we're going forward on the presumption that everybody will want all of their money and all of their principal and all of their interest back. And the fact that they don't when the time comes is a different issue. It's great, but we can't presume that. Brilliant, thank you. Anybody get any other questions or thoughts that they'd like to share? Um, I just have a quick question for all of you. Um, so as part of this week, we've obviously got lots of different sessions happening. And on Friday, our final session um, is being chaired by Mark Crothall from the Scottish Tourism Alliance. Um, and the Scottish Tourism Alliance leads on the national tourism strategy. Um, Obviously, over the past while, the focus has been on uh, COVID and recovery, but we're starting to move towards a new phase now. And, I, and I'm really keen that we take this opportunity to influence what's, go, what, you know, what's happening around the next action plan. Um, so I'm keen for every session to take away some key thoughts, some, some key themes and really some asks. We're coming at this from a solution focused point of view. Um, we're not having a whinge. <laughs> we're very much coming up with um, with new ideas um, and trying to support the tourism industry to support us, if that makes sense. Um, so I would be really keen to know if anybody has any particular thoughts or asks, um, you know, of national bodies in supporting community-led tourism going forward around finance. Has anybody got any particular thoughts? Pauline, do you think there are some key key things that have come out that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things, if I was on the other side of the screen, one of the things that I would be asking for is, um, in what way can the can limited sums of money be be leveraged to bring in much more sums of money? And I think Jackie's is a very good example of that in terms of 
a pound for a pound or whatever. But I also think in terms of loan, um, in terms of guarantees, bond underwriting guarantees, that gives people confidence to get the money, knowing that if all comes to all, there'll be somebody, the money will be given back to them. Um, I think that there's, um, you know, just the whole concept of how do we make as much money from a little pot of money? How do we blow that up? Um, I think is really important. Um, I think grants are an important part, um, but grants can also act as a de-risking mechanism for organisations. So rather than just being given a grant, um, you know, it would be brilliant if that grant was then, if there was going to be a need for repayable finance, then that grant actually formed the basis of some sort of um, blended finance because that makes everything, even if you were going to an ordinary mainstream social investment provider, the fact that there's already a grant in there as part of that would make it much easier for them to lend to, to organizations as well. So I think the question I would pose is that, what is the purpose, and it's something that I don't think grant funders ask, and I know I've sat in a number of panels over the years, but what is the purpose of the money? I know that sounds a, a silly question, but what is the purpose of the money? If the money is just purely to get out the door, you know, to and first come, first serve, and it's gone, then that's fine. But money, that pot can have other purposes. If it's to maximise the amount of money going into the sector, that's a very different thing than just giving out the grants and when it's done, it's done. So there's 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 um, definitely, I think, asks around some of that. I don't know whether people would agree, but. Actually. No, I would agree with everything Pauline says. I think it's a really new area, this whole bonds and shares in community finance. And so trying to have that conversation with people perhaps who've, and, and the only reason that I'm kind of slightly confident even being here is because my community has been through a whole share process, which without being handheld by a huge number of organizations we would never be able to do. But I wonder if, if an easier starting point in terms of somebody, you know, like Mark, who is high up in a private, they're not private sector, but a membership organization that probably hasn't, I might be wrong, but probably hasn't done this kind of approach before, is to say this is a huge amount of investment that only communities can tap into. And that is why it's so important that the tourism sector works with communities as partners in developing local tourism offerings, because if you don't look at what you're missing, you know, this amazing opportunity. I think that's an excellent point, Artemis, and certainly I think one that will we'll feed into the final session. And I think also, you know, um, by using forms of democratic finance, private sector, because let's be honest, community-led tourism, the reality of the matter is that, you know, like all everything that we do, the impact spreads much wider. You know, the impact will be much wider. The impact will be on B&Bs and everything else. So the idea that somehow they could be investors, you know, in an infrastructure, a local community tourism infrastructure, investors in their own right, um, and, and therefore making things happen, not just because I think uh, if they're just, it's a bit like, a bit more like the business improvement district model, you know, or even about the Christmas lights, you know, every, all the businesses contribute, but they all gain the benefit collectively of people coming into the, the, the into the, the shops during the Christmas switch on or whatever. So there's something about kind of pulling them a bit, a bit more into that sense of community. Um, that will actually give them benefits rather than just investing in their own business. Obviously, they can do that, but you know, but by investing slightly lar larger and pretend, and you know, getting their money back for that as well, that actually they can make shape things happen. So that kind of business improvement district model, I think, uh, and the way that they all contribute, it doesn't matter what your legal structure is. Everybody feeds into something to make something happen. A community democratic financing model is the best vehicle for doing something like that. We actually had a, a session this morning on the, the bid model um, and there's you can see that there's very clear overlap uh, between the two sessions. David. 
Hi. Um, I suppose my my comment about it would be um, I'm the chair of the Cullen Tourism Group, and the the group's been going for twenty over twenty five years now, um, and just sort of came together with interested people who wanted to do things for tourism in Cullen. So it's a really informal group, and I'd probably say even calling it a group now isn't the right term because there's so few of us involved. And we've tried to keep going through COVID and doing things. And um, we have we have no funding. We literally hand to mouth, picking up money off the street wherever we can find it. Um, but we were successful a couple of years ago getting some money from Scotland's Towns Partnership. Um, and that was to redo our website, some signage, a promotional leaflet. But that was all hinged on um, the town centre. And that was what those funds were about in the sort of COVID recovery. Uh, but if we hadn't have got that funding, there would have been no way that we could have ever done the activity we've done the past couple of years. And we've probably needed a new website and a new map for the town for about 10 years. And, you know, the money that we were bringing in through our little seasonal tourist office covered the costs of having that office, but nothing else. So from my perspective, I think the funding is a real issue for us. And that was why I was interested to hear today. And I think from a tourism perspective, it all comes down. Um, you know, you've got the Visit Scotland funding, the DMOs get the funding. But then below that, there isn't really anything there or a mechanism. Um, so, I mean, we work with our local DMO and we're on the border with Aberdeenshire as well. So Murray and Aberdeenshire. And I think we feel really well supported in that sense. But then there's no opportunities that I can see for us to get funding. And going back to a comment somebody made a little while ago about it's just small pots of money. Like for me um, to get a thousand pounds would be a life or a game changer, if you like, what I could do with that. But there isn't really the opportunities there for us to get the money. Um, and I'm conscious that there's hundreds or thousands of tourism groups like us that exist and we're all I suppose trying to do the same thing um, and I mean we try to align with our local DMO and visit Scotland and you know we try to tick all the right boxes to fit in with these things and it you know it isn't easy but if we hadn't have got that money from STP I don't know that we could have ever done the activities we've done and we used to get some contributions from the businesses but again because of COVID, they've either not been forthcoming and or we haven't felt that we could ask for money because their money's tight and we're still not out of it yet. So um, I think I'm waff waffling on, but um, it, it, I suppose from my perspective, it's not money for money's sake that I'm after. It's just money to allow us to continue to do what we're doing. And I think we've had really good feedback in Cullen about the new website um, and the leaflet and we've had the map maps produced that we've used on signage and the great thing for us now is we have that artwork there so if we can scrape together the funds to update it every so often we kind of feel there's a legacy of the funding we've got but it's very hard to make even that money to just you know if a new, if a business closes and a new one opens how do we add them onto the map because that's the designer's time you know to make the amendments and either print something or even if it's just the pdf so I think we it's it's whether there's any sort of long term support might be available or I don't know, I, you know, I don't know. And I mean, we keep chugging away and we're, we're quite happy doing what we do and we have no expectations of anything. But I think, you know, if STA are aware that there are small scale groups who are trying to do all the right things and, and link in. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'll stop waffling. That, but that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I think we all completely agree that money is just ridiculously tight. I mean, it was tight anyway and difficult to to get hold of. But I think that um, as we're emerging from COVID, I think it's good. You know, it's obviously going to be even tighter, and that a lot of money was put into the tourism industry to keep it going. Um, I strongly suspect that we'll not see um, quite the same levels going forward. So yeah, so I think that we we have to tell that story definitely about how um, small amounts of support, um, even if it's not financial, sometimes it is actually just um, on the ground hand-holding support um, can, can be life or death really to a group. 
Um, I'm very much aware of the time and everybody will have busy days or will want to escape into the glorious sunshine. Um, thank you very much to Pauline. That's been a really useful session, I think, that is, and it's been fantastic to get everybody engaged in the conversations as well. I hope you have all gained from it. Please remember that there's lots of sessions throughout the rest of the week. Please do sign up to them um, and please sign up for that final session as well, because I think it would be great to have as many voices there as possible. And I hope you all have a fantastic day. I'll just add as well that Pauline popped her email address into the chat if anybody wants to get in contact. And I popped in her um, website address as well. So that's in there. So, um, yeah. Can I just say, your... sir, thank you all very much. Sometimes I go on these things and um, there's dead silence. <laughs> It's, and it's not quite, uh, yes, but I've really enjoyed all your questions. I think they've been quite informed and actually I've learned a lot myself today, which I'm really pleased about. Um, so thank you very much for your participation. It really helps to make these things come alive because they can be quite dry otherwise. Um, so yeah, so I appreciate you kind of making the effort to come up with questions and queries and questions and clarifications and whatever. And thanks also, Sarah, for actually asking me to do it and also for doing your excellent sharing. She's very good at sharing, if you're ever looking for a chair, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Pauline. I hope you all have Thank a lovely you. afternoon. Maybe you will see Bye. you in the Heritage one later on. <laughs> Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. -bye.